So here we are in chapter eight, learning about our new topic, Byzantine art. And I want to walk you through the first sections of the chapter to orient you to the information and to help you gain skills and confidence in working with the textbook. As you've already learned, the textbook authors, Marilyn Stockstad and Michael Cothran, launch each chapter by inviting you to look closely at one artwork. They use that close up to sketch out some of the major topics that play out across the, top, the chapter. So here in chapter eight, figure eight one, is where they present to you David battling Goliath as that first close up, a silver plate. Look down to the caption and you see it is identified as one of the David plates made in Constantinople, 629 to 630 CE and made out of silver now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So you see right away that the material is a luxury material, silver, expensive. And the art is a plate. You would think a plate is functional, yes, but this plate is actually presenting a figurative scene in low relief sculpture. So relief sculpture means that the figures are carved to stand out, but they're still attached to the surface of the, of the silver panel. So what do the authors do to get you thinking about this David plate? That's always the question to ask when you're reading. What is the author doing? So let's read to find out. The robust figures on this huge silver plate enact three signature episodes in the youthful hero David's combat with the Philistine giant Goliath. And here, a Bible citation. They're telling you about a biblical story, which some of you may know, the story of David and Goliath. In the upper register, David, easily identified by his youth and as the good guy by his prominent halo, and Goliath challenge each other on either side of a seated classical personification of the stream that will be the source of David's stones for the ensuing battle. Let's pause here because they're asking you to look. They're telling you here in the upper section, which is called the upper register. We, re we use the term register when an artwork is separated into sections like this. In the upper register, you get this moment where this young boy, because that's what the biblical story is about, a young kid named David in the middle of a battle between the Hebrews and the Philistines wants to take on the commander of the Philistines who happens to be a giant. And so one of the things they told you in this reading is that there is a seated classical personification of a stream. And you're probably thinking, what are they talking about? <clears throat> Excuse me. Right here, this figure is a holdover of paganism because in the ancient greek and roman religion rivers and streams were represented in artworks by a naked guy holding some nice vegetation because each river and stream had a deity remember the greek and roman deities were nature deities so now they've they've given you a sense of with a story and a place because they've explained that this figure represents the stream where David is going to get his stones. The authors are a little bit mm, assuming that you know about David's stones, which you might not. If you are Jewish or Christian or, Islam, or Muslim, you might. But in fact, many people won't know the whole story that David will kill Goliath with a slingshot and a rock lodged in the head of Goliath. That's the scene represented here. So they go on in the next section to say, the confrontation itself appears in the middle of the plate in a broad figural frieze whose size signals its primary importance. Use your eyes here 
to think about what they're saying. They want you to notice that all of a sudden the figures are larger, the whole section, the register itself is larger, because this is what you could call hierarchical scale. That's the term we use when something is bigger, when it's more important. The same characters appear here. They're smaller because that's the moment when the battle has not yet happened. And then we're going to see this is the moment. It seems pretty important to me. David is chopping off the head of Goliath. But at that point, Goliath was already dead. David kills him with there's the slingshot and there's the rock. <clears throat> So this first paragraph is dense with information and references that may be unfamiliar. And if we go back to our question, what are the authors doing? What they're doing here is dealing with subject matter and iconography. They're giving you the iconography that allows you to identify David as the guy with the slingshot and Goliath as the mighty commander of the army. So what happens then in the next paragraph? They're moving on here, if you look, to style. Some may be surprised to see a Judeo-Christian subject portrayed in a style that was developed for the exploits of classical heroes. So they're wanting you to recognize that this Jewish and Christian subject is nevertheless painted in the style of the Greek and Roman classical tradition, a pre-Christian tradition, a pagan tradition. And so they're introducing the term eclecticism to help you understand how the visual arts of Christianized Rome become the Byzantine Empire. Eclecticism being the mixing of different elements in a new way. Continue. As the authors move along, their focus shifts. This was one of nine David plates unearthed in Cyprus in 1902. So they're telling us now about the history of the object after it was found by people in the modern period. Control stamps guaranteeing the purity of the material, much like the stamps of sterling on silver today, date them to the reign of the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius, who ruled 613 to 641 CE. So they're giving us the physical evidence that's on the plates, which allows us to date their making to a very specific time period, even to a specific emperor. Displayed in the home of their owners, they, will, they were visual proclamations of wealth education and refined taste, just like collections of art and antiques in homes now. Yes, this is actually a rather banal observation for the authors to make, since the dirty little secret of the art world is money. And that's going to come up again and again in our studies, and in particular in this chapter, where the most important, the most important thing we study is a grand work of architecture the Hagia Sophia, where the Emperor Justinian is willing to spend the entire treasury of his empire on this building. So yes, money, status, power, that keeps driving the art we're looking at. We come back to the text. A constellation of iconographic and historical factors, however, allows us to uncover a subtler message. Note this idea. For the original owners, the single combat of David and Goliath might have recalled a situation involving their own emperor and enemies. They're suggesting that this story was meaningful in a political way to them. And so they go on to explain that the reign of Heraclius was marked by war with the Sasanian Persians, a decisive moment in the final campaign of 628 to 629 CE occurred when Heraclius, the emperor himself, stepped forward for single combat with the Persian general Rosatis, and the emperor prevailed, presaging, that means foreshadowing, prefiguring, Byzantine victory. 
Now, this is unfamiliar to us. This is not, we do not live in a world where our president is going to go to Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan and have hand to hand combat. However, in this world, this is related to the idea that Heraclius isn't just a military victor, he should be seen as a new David. And this is going to be a major theme going forward. The ways in which emperors and rulers use biblical stories to proclaim their power and their spiritual authority. And it relates to the idea that the Christians of this time are in the habit of seeing Old Testament, that is Hebrew Bible figures, as prefigurations of Christian events and they're themselves as also involved in that pattern of prefiguration.